Good morning, friends. Happy Sunday. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. Uh, we're going to get started with some worship. If you would stand and join us.
group of people who has gathered this morning. Um, God, make yourself known in this place. We love you. And everybody said, amen. I uh, would love it if at this point in time you had the chance to stand up and just greet a few people around you. You can do a fist bump. You can do a high five. You can do a handshake. Hugs are allowed. Go for it. Just introduce yourself to a few people.
Good morning, church family. My name is Mary Nicole, and I just have a couple of friends who's four years from me. Um, if you are new to this church, if this is your first time or second time and you haven't done this yet, fill out this card that's in the seat back in front of you. I remember that. And take it to the Welcome Center, and we would love to meet you and get to know you. Um, if you have any questions about the church, you can certainly go to the Welcome Center, or next Sunday, we're having a Connect with Friends Sunday um, right after church, and you can get to know more about the church then as well and learn a little bit of something. Next Saturday, we're having our prayer breakfast, so both men and women have a prayer breakfast. The men will be here at 8 a.m. on Saturday, and somebody will serve you some food, I'm sure. And then at 10 a.m., the women are meeting at the Collins home, and somebody will serve you some food, for sure. And we will pray for the various purposes and reasons and the church and everything else. It's a great, great breakfast, so please join us. Um, then the following Saturday, um, we are having family dodgeball here at the church. So family dodgeball means families, like Small children dodgeball. So if you want to do more serious dodgeball, <laughs> the teens are doing dodgeball the same day. A little bit, the students here, a little bit later. So just come to that one if you really want to throw hard, right? <laughs> and then on May 4th is our annual ladies' tea. It is such a wonderful event. If you have any questions about that, please see the Welcome Center or see me or see almost any room, woman in this room, um, and we can certainly tell you about it. It's a great event, a great outreach, and um, we would love to have you there. And we need men to serve as well. So see the Welcome Center if you'd like to serve the women, gentlemen. Um, and Kyle's going to come up because I have a, an announcement that, is really exciting. Yeah. I'm so excited. Very cool. Um, we have just finished our second interview of a pastor candidate that we are very excited about. Mm -hmm. And we have decided that this is the pastor that God has brought mm -hmm. to Corona Friends. Friends Corona. Either way. Yeah. Um, and we're excited about it. So we would like for all of you to have the opportunity to meet this gentleman. His name is Matt Dietz. Mm -hmm. You all saw him Two months ago, maybe? Yeah, Super Bowl Sunday. Matt had the chance to come here and preach. Uh, that was even before he was considering a call to this place. Um, but since that time, we've moved forward as a search team to be able to put out a job description, to be able to invite uh, applications. And Matt uh, put his application in very, very quickly. And we've now had two different interviews as a search team uh, with him. And both times... He has done exceptionally well. He has um, represented himself, I think, just been able to articulate the fact that he feels called to the city of Corona and to also this church. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're eager to be able to continue to move forward in the process with him. We're being very prayerful about it. Um, and so today we wanted to encourage you about two things. Um, one is that he has come and preached here previously. And so we would love it if you have the chance to maybe go back. Uh, our, our sermons are available online, and we'll actually send out an email later this week that directs you uh, specifically to Matt's sermon, and you have the chance to listen to that and hear him. Um, and then the second thing is that we're excited about that he is penciled in to be able to come and preach next week on the 21st here uh, in this space. He's got a little, uh, there's a little something that might happen though between now and then. So His wife is expecting a baby any day. Yeah. So we're yeah. just kept relying on God. Yeah. And so if the timing is right, he will come and preach next Sunday. Yep. And then he will be around to meet everyone after and we'll have a little meet and greet. Yeah. If that doesn't work out because God has other plans for the timing, uh -huh. then he will come yeah. and meet everyone. It just probably won't be next Sunday. Yeah. Yep, so God's timing is going to be right regardless, but uh, we're ex excited for the Dietz family to be able to welcome a new baby into their home, um, uh, but that means that we would probably have to push back him coming here for a number of, uh, of weeks uh, because he'll have time to be able to be there with his family. But we wanted to update all of you about that so that you can pray, um, so that you can join us in the process of praying for uh, Matt and for his wife Tiffany. 
um, as they go through the, a big thing right in front of them of having a new baby, uh, but then also to be able to pray for this place, uh, for, for yourselves, about what is, it, what is God calling us to and who is God calling to be a part of this overall experience. So we're going to pray right now. Um, and Mary, if you would be willing to do that, that would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just invite you to just put your hands out in front of you as a way, like we've said before, that we can call to God and say, God, help us in this process. So, Mary, if you would. Lord God Almighty, you have been so, so gracious to this church, Father God. We just, we thank you for all you have done for all of us, for your leading and for your guidance for the last 30 years, Father God. And I just, I'm so grateful to you for getting us to this point, Lord God. We have, we have just done our best to follow you. We thank you that Matt has come forward. We thank you that Matt and his family are expecting a new little baby. We ask your blessing upon them. We ask your blessing upon this time for them. And there's a lot of big changes in their lives, Father God. I just ask that you bless them with your love, with your peace, with your hope. And Lord God, I just, I ask your blessing upon this place. Father God, and all of these people, Lord God, help us to hear your voice, to know you are near, to trust in you, Father God, and help us to follow you. Lord God, we put this at your feet. We know this is your church. And Father God, we just want to honor and glorify you. So Lord God, would you just help us to do that? Because we can't even do that without your help. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> After uh, the service is over today, um, members of the search team that have had the chance to sit with Matt, to be able to talk things through with him, uh, will be available um, up here in front and would invite you, if you have specific questions, that you could come up here and just be able to talk with us a little bit. Uh, none of this is you know, hidden, um, but there is just kind of a sequence to it, and now we're getting to the time where we can be a little bit more open about who it is that we're talking with and, and uh, just to be excited about what God might be doing. So that's uh, available after service if you would like to uh, be a part of that. Um, the other thing that I want to do, and just so I can say, I'm Kyle. I'm the campus pastor here right now. Thrilled to be able to be with you all today. Uh, we are actually going to have, at the end of uh, our service today, we're going to have two baptisms. Um, and so we are really, really e- eager for that to be able to happen. So we're going to be um, having Presh Cox uh, get baptized here in just a, a little while. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, another one of our high school students, whose name is Joey, is going to be getting baptized uh, today as well. So uh, we have the tank up there, and we're going to be putting two more people into the water as a way for them to publicly declare the fact that they are, uh, what these shirts say, which is that they are uh, experiencing new life in Jesus and that they're made new. And so we're so excited that that gets to be a part of our service. Um, I'm telling you that now. Uh, because if you're here in the room and you feel stirred that, that that's something that you want to be a part of, uh, we want to talk to you about that. And we want to be able to uh, press in and be able to make sure that um, if, you know, if you're in a place where that's your next step, then come and speak to us. And we'd love to be able to, to help you figure that out. So um, the, we're in spring, right? Uh, this past uh, week, there were a couple of days where, I don't know if you felt it, there was, there was warmth outside, right? It was actually hot at one point, and people, I think, were like, thank you, right? Like, yes, right? Um, and, and then the rain is back, right? And that's okay. Uh, but one of the things that's happening in spring is that there are all these uh, flowers that are blooming and that are, are popping up. And this is actually a picture taken um, from uh, my street, right? I go for walks every once in a while with my kids, and these are flowers. This is not, no, that's not professional photography. That's just me on my iPhone, right, taking a picture. Um, and here's one of the things that was really, really fun for, for us this past week. We, as we went for a walk with uh, my boys, they started to get excited about the flowers, and they were like, well, let's pick some for mom, Right? And so they did, and they started not just one type of flower, but they picked all kinds of different flowers. So this is our son, Graham, and you can see that he's got a whole bunch, just different variety of 
flowers that he was grabbing and putting, uh, just taking care of and, and gradually walking along. And everybody that he saw along the street, he would yell at them from across the street. He'd say, these flowers are for my mom, right? And he, he even, if he had a couple of extra, he offered a couple of flowers to some other people that were out for a walk. We had a neighbor who saw him walking by with all those flowers, and they actually had some roses in their front, and he clipped him one, a great big red bloom. So we got to bring these flowers home and got to show them to my wife. And they were, they were I think, more eager to give them to her than, than she knew even what to do with, right? Um, but same day, uh, something happened a little while later. Graham got the chance to go to a birthday party. And he put those flowers down, right? How cute, little, you know, boy with flowers. And then he picked up a sword and a crown. Because the birthday party that we went to was all about Narnia. And these boys, for like an hour and a half straight, just beat on each other with those swords, right? They had their crowns on, everyone had a crown, and they were battling, and they were swinging, and just, you know, I mean, there was tears occasionally, but they had so much fun just being, uh, like, attacking, climbing up on a fort. It was, it was an impressive uh, time. But um, those are a little bit of a contrast, right? You got this kid on one hand who's gathering flowers, and it's so sweet, he wants to do it for his mom. And then on the other side, you got this little boy who he wants to go out and battle, right? And he has a sword and a crown, right? Well, there's a little bit of contrast that exists in any kid between flowers and crowns, right? And the great thing is, is that he can do both, right? There's no part of me that looks and says, no flowers, only crowns, or no swords, only flowers, right? I'm glad that he's got both within him, right? But one of the things that we're going to be talking about today as we continue to look at the book of James is the contrast between flowers and crowns. Flowers that bloom very, very beautifully, but that right now at our house are already, just a day later, wilted, shriveled, and starting to kind of turn in on themselves, Versus a crown, that was just a, a fake, you know, like crown, but verse, a, a real crown, which James talks about, a crown of life that lasts. And so there's a number of contrasts in the scripture that we're going to be looking at today, and I, I just want to point out a couple of them to you ahead of time. Um, James, in just a couple of verses, when he wrote to people who needed to know about what it looked like to walk with God, he wrote this letter to them, which is now a part of our Bible. When he wrote to them, he had these different contrasts that he talked about. In just a couple of verses, he talked about the the contrast between those that are in a humble place financially um, versus those who were in a high spot, rich. He talked about the difference between the gifts that God gives us and the lures of temptation, which strike to try and trap us or hook us. He talks about the difference between things that are lasting, things that day after day after day you can count on and they're not going to fall apart. They're not going to wilt uh, versus those things that are limited and that in just a short period of time might be gone. And then he talks about the, the contrast between birth and death. And so in just a couple of verses, he's throwing out all these different contrasts. And one of the reasons why James is working and talking with people about contrast is because contrast does something to your brain. If you are in a dark room and you step out into the sun, suddenly that contrast is, it can be jarring, right? If you're in a nice, warm setting and somebody throws a cup of cold water on you, that contrast, right, it jolts you. And I just want you to know that James, when he was writing to his audience over 2,000 years ago, they were people who uh, were displaced from their homes, They were people who were trying to figure out in the midst of a lot of difficulty what it looked like to actually continue to be followers of Jesus. And he is not mean to them, but he is challenging to them. He gives them some contrast that kind of comes with a little bit of weight because in that he wants to jar them and and, and wake them up so that their perspective, the way they look at life, is one that can take in both the difficulties, the darkness, and that also can hold on to and consider the hope and the light of life. And in that, he says to them, 
look at the life that you can live as you walk with Jesus. And that's what we're talking about today. So if you have a Bible with you, I would love it if you opened it up to James chapter 1. Uh, we're continuing, the, the, this is our second week looking at this book of James, which was written by someone who had some really, really interesting family. Um, James was one of the sons of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus would have been considered his half-brother. Um, the letter that he wrote is considered um, most likely the earliest writing that was a part of the New Testament which means that there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There were no, none of the other letters. Um, James was uh, a leader within the church in Jerusalem and one of the first people to actually write down and, and uh, to have become a part of the Bible the things that God wanted to say to different people at that time. So um, we pressed in last week and we talked a lot about perseverance and trial and we talked about perspective uh, we talked about the importance of prayer, and we're continuing with that today. Those themes, perspective, prayer, uh, and, and uh, perseverance, they, they continue in some ways in the passage that we're going to read. So we're in uh, chapter 1, we're going to be at verse 9, and I'm going to read all the way through to verse 18. We're going to read a whole section together, and then we're going to keep uh, pressing in bit by bit on some of the things that James wants to tell us, that God wants to use to speak to us in terms of what's going on. So, uh, I'm going to pray, and then let's dive in. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that scripture is something that, though you spoke through a, a man and what he wrote down many, many years ago, thank you, God, that here in Corona, in these seats today, that these things uh, can, can speak to us through your Holy Spirit. So, God, uh, t teach us, talk to us today, that we might be more and more uh, like you, and more and more your people in this world. We pray this all. Amen. James 1, verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire, desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full, bro, full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. A number of different verses. James uh, says a lot in just a short little section. And he's covered a bunch of different topics. But hopefully, as I, as I read, you were able to just see some of the contrasts that he's drawing. It's not always a one-to-one, -one, but he's putting out there these different ways of viewing things and understanding stuff. And very few of us right now would say, oh man, I love what James said. It's great to be in poverty. Oh, it's wonderful to be poor. He's, he's saying... Um, right off the bat, that believers in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position. That's a, that's a challenging thing for him to say right off the bat, because none of us wants to be in a spot where our finances are low. Nobody likes to be living paycheck to paycheck, right? But he's trying to draw our attention to a different way, a heavenly way of thinking about money, about thinking about income, thinking about assets. 
He's saying to his followers, who most likely at that time were people who experienced a, a great deal of persecution, potentially property loss, because they had had to travel from one place to another. And they may have been people of great means when they were originally in the city of Jerusalem or when they were in other places. But now they find themselves uprooted. They find themselves in the midst of turmoil. Maybe they're looking for jobs. Maybe they are wrestling with what their pay is. Maybe they're finding that things are just so expensive in the sitting, the places that they live that it's just tough. Maybe they lost a contract in some way, right? He's talking to people who are very much like us. People who know the stress of trying to provide. And he's telling them, hey, if you're in a humble position, notice he's not talking down to them. He's just using the word humble. He's saying if you're in a humble position, then you can actually take pride in that. And he says, on the other hand, the rich, those who are like maybe a blooming wildflower, who've got a lot of flash, who've got a lot of color and vibrance to their life. Those that, you know, they kind of strut, right? They've got a little peacock to them, right? Him, to those people, he's saying, hey, watch out. Be aware that there is humiliation that could come for you. James isn't against money. He's not against working hard. He's not talking down about uh, the finances that we actually earn. He's not doing that. But what he is trying to draw contrast is between the way that the world is always putting up on there, on the pedestal, as a height, all those people who have achieved, achieved, achieved. And he's saying, wait, hold up. That's not how we view rich and poor. That is not how God views high and low. And he says, For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. You can be going about your business. You can be doing just what you're supposed to do. And things may change. I think that just a couple of years ago when COVID hit, there were, a, there's a, just a great changing that happened within the world. And there were many people who I think had to rethink how they did life and how they did business. And guess what? Those changes can happen again. And James isn't trying to scare people, but he is trying to help us understand that when it comes to money, when it comes to finance, that these things can be fleeting, that they can slip from one spot to another. And that there is a, a, a greater thing to anchor ourselves to. And so he goes on. And he talks about the fact that, that there's more to it. How much was the lottery that just came out and was won within a couple of weeks? I think it was found, uh, the lottery ticket was in Oregon. And it was $1.3 billion. Okay? Okay. You, like, what would you do with $1.3 billion? You're like, I got a couple ideas, right, of what I could do with it, right? That's amazing. That's impressive. And you don't have to raise your hand right now if you bought a couple of lottery tickets. I'll be honest with you. I was in the grocery line a couple times. I was talking to people, and when I learned it was $1.3 billion, I was like, hmm, okay. Let's just scan that on top of the groceries already, right? Because wouldn't that be nice, right? But one of the things that we have to figure out is, um, what are we putting our trust in? What's our foundation on, right? And then he continues with this. Not just a flower conversation, but a conversation about this. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood that test, the person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's something interesting about a crown. Not very many of us would walk around in our day-to-day life with a crown on our head, right? Little kids, sometimes, if they get like a tiara, right, or if they get a crown and they show up at your house and they want to just wear their crown for the day, you're, you, you kind of play with them, right? You're like, oh, you look beautiful, or oh, wow, you're the king today. Okay, that's wonderful. But very few of us. Even if we were royalty, right, if we had royal blood, or if we were the the president of a company, would put on a crown and walk into the office and say, good day, my liege, right? Like, 
That's just not what we would do, okay? Because a crown, we all know, is a symbol. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't go. It has value to it. A crown is something that isn't going to perish, but it's something that has, makes a statement to the world. And what James is doing here is he knows that many of the people he's writing to are in humble circumstances. And so he draws a contrast. He says, if you're in that humble place, take pride in it. For when you persevere through the difficulties that you have, the challenges that you have, I want you to know that God has a crown for you. And I want to say this to all of you right now. God has a crown for you, a crown of life. It will outmatch anything that has been placed on the heads of any king that has ever ruled within our earth. It is beautiful. It is profound. And it will be a symbol of something that is so much more than just earthly wealth or uh, power or influence. It is a crown of life, a crown that will not perish, a crown that when you place, when Jesus himself places it on your head, there will come with it a beautiful, beautiful future. That's what he's telling them and trying to put in front of them. And so whether you're a prince or a princess as a little kid and you wear these little crowns, God is calling us to consider something that might be more valuable than just what our bank accounts say or a retirement account might have. And then he continues. He jumps forward with this kind of different conversation. James 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. I want to say something about this, right, as I start talking about temptation. Um, I am not going to talk today uh, about temptation in a way that is meant to grind you into the ground, okay? Because I think that all of us here could very, very quickly, if we were honest, just acknowledge the fact that temptation is something that has hit every single one of us. And that sometimes we have been proud of the way that we have walked through temptation, but that there are other times where we could say, no, I was tempted by that. It was, maybe it was something as small as a craving, right? No, I did eat the whole pack, right? But then there's other times where you say, no, I, I gave in to fear, or I gave in to lust, or I gave in to laziness, that I, I chose in those moments to actually follow through, and, and I'm not proud of that, or maybe I'm not even aware of the fact that that's what I've been doing. And, and so I, I want you to know that as we talk about temptation, hear me say this very, very clearly, and I want to give you something to, to be able to remind you of, of this, okay? When we talk about temptation today, um, I want to talk about temptation from a perspective of conviction as opposed to a perspective of condemnation. And if you would, put your hand out in front of you, okay? Just like this, and then put your other hand out like this, okay? Condemnation and guilt is something that seeks to crush us and then continue to grind us and hold us down. That is what the devil longs to do to people, is that he would say, ah, you've done wrong, you are bad, you have messed up, you have failed, and then to grind that person and never let them move, get up, or experience any kind of life or forward progress. That's condemnation. Okay? But what we know because of the cross, what we know because of the story within Scripture, is that God comes and he is very willing to challenge and convict. But he does not seek to simply crush us there. And so this is the motion that I actually have found and people have taught me that is very, very helpful, is that God comes and his conviction also hits and it hurts but then it moves forward. It is more of a momentum builder that is meant to take us somewhere else than simply that grinding conviction that is meant to put us under his foot and keep us down there. We have a God who is aware of the fact that this world is filled with temptation. He tells us to flee from it. He tells us to take every thought captive. And then 
when we do mess up, when we screw up, when we find ourselves in places where we are just at a loss because we have once again stepped into the place that we wish that we had not, he says to us, feel the pain, feel the hurt, be honest about it, learn from it, but don't feel that you need to stay there. Instead, take my hand and let's move you to a different place, to a different path. And here's what we have so much confidence in. God is not the one that is tempting us. That's what James is saying. And God can't be tempted. God is in a spot where you have to wonder, well, can I trust him? No, when he comes and he hits you with a conviction and then he just wants to take your hand and say, come with me. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. Instead, he's the father saying to us, take my hand. I know you're in a rough spot. I know you fell off the path. I know you're tempted right now and you'll be tempted again down the road. But guess what? I'm taking hold of you and I want you to move with me out of temptation, out of trial to something better. James says very, very clearly, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And this is the contrast. The contrast between this idea that, oh, God's tempting me. God wants me to trip up. Or just the acknowledgement that, you know what? It's actually our desires. These desires within us that are evil and wrong. That unfortunately take us to these places that, that we wish we hadn't gone. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And we live in the age of desire, where people are constantly just putting it out there that, hey, if you desire something, go after it. If you have an appetite for something, oh, run for it. No matter what you've got, oh, you feel that that's something that should be right or maybe that you should pursue, oh, go for it. In this age, it's almost like desire has been unleashed. I don't have any pets, but if I did, they would have to be leashed up or at least trained at some point in time, right? I do have children. I do not let them, I do not put them on a leash, right? But I do not let them just run wherever they want to, right? I have to guide them. I have to discipline them. I have to show them the route that they should go. When it comes to desire within our current world, though, people are like, oh, just let your desires run wild. Let that flame burn. And so we have people who, over periods of time, their desire leads them to places, deep places, that they really never should have gone. And so I want to show you this. It's it's this James 1, verse 15. It says, then after desire has conceived, he's giving us kind of this birth picture where even if you got away with it, even if nobody knows about it, even if nobody saw, he's, he's saying, no, desire has conceived. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. And I have had areas in my own life where, unfortunately, because of an addiction or because of just a desire that I've let kind of run wild, that I have hurt people. I have hurt myself. I have wasted so much time dabbling in different substances or different relationships that just, I thought that they were going to meet the desire of my heart, but they weren't. They were just taking me farther and farther off the path that God wanted for me. And that, it, it stinks to live with regrets and to be in a place where when I look back on my own life that I could say, why, what was it that got me to that place? I hate that. So I want to show you just here a couple of steps really, really quickly. Of uh, They're all D words that kind of give us a little bit of a process of what I, I think happens um, when it comes to sin and desire. Um, desire in itself is not wrong. We are desiring people. We should be those that have a desire for things. We, we should have a, a want that kind of lives within us. Nothing's wrong with that, but there is a twisting that can happen to these desires, especially when we pursue them to, or to meet them in ways that really don't line up with what God wants. And that's when the deception comes in. That's when there's this sense of, well, 
maybe this isn't good, but I should just justify it or I should just rationalize it. Or maybe there's been something that's been told to us that isn't true and, and we just go with it. And then after that is the step of design. This is where we begin to actually plan and think through how to actually achieve that thing, um, which we know probably isn't good for us, but that we, if we have to hide, then we have to do it on the sneak, or maybe we have to do it on the sly so that we don't get caught. Or maybe it's something that we just desire and we're going to do it openly and, and we don't even think it's bad, and so we have to build some scaffolding to be able to get up to it. And that's when disobedience happens, the actual action. And disobedience means that we did not obey, or, and that could be either because we didn't do something that we were supposed to do, or we did something that we weren't supposed to do. And the result that James talks about is a kind of death. There is a dying that happens in relationship. There is a dying that might happen in terms of our reputation. There is a dying that happens in our sense of ourself. Oh, I did it again. And so this process can happen like in an instant. We literally can fly through those. And you might say, well, where's, where's decision up on there? Well, it's not there. Because guess what? Sometimes these things flow so quickly from one to the next that you didn't, you're not even aware of the fact that you've already moved all the way to disobedience. You didn't understand the desires that were within you. And so when the temptation came, it was six Oreos, right? It was, you know, Del Taco, right? I don't want to make light of temptation, but, but sometimes that, that's a good analogy for it, how quickly it can move us from desire to death. And what I want to put in front of you today is this, this idea, that because of the cross, there is great grace, and that the divine actually is willing to also be on there to help us at any point along that process, have the wisdom to step away. Have the wisdom to be able to stop and say, wait, I've got to check this desire. I've got to rein it in. I've got to think differently about it. God, could you make my heart, my mind, my body, could you make me desire the right things? God, could you do that? And then deception. God, could you teach me and show me how to actually see the truth in these situations so I think about it correctly and so I'm not just pulled off to the side? And then design. God, could you enable me not to make plans that would take me to a place of secrecy or a place of lies or a place of hurt or a place of whatever else, but God, instead, help me design that, no, I'm going to go and pursue better things. I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to reach out to a friend. I'm going to find a way that my life is actually geared in an opposite direction so that instead of disobedience, I can have obedience. I can be in a place where I do things that I'm proud of, things that I experience as a positive, and that instead of there being death as the result, no, I, I skipped going down that street. I moved over instead to a different place, and I find myself now in a place of life, a place of being restored. I want to show you a couple pictures really, really quickly of a couple different types of paths that exist. And here's the thing. Some of these paths, it's pretty clear uh, where you want to walk, right? Those are pretty clear paths. But there are many pathways in life that at times we get to a point where we don't know what our next step is to take. We don't know how do I walk through this. And I want you to know that that is why God's word exists is that it would be a light for us, that it would be a lamp, that it would actually shine on, the Bible says, that it would shine on our feet to give us an understanding of how to take our next step. Because some of these pathways that we have to walk in life, I don't know what you're walking through, but I know that sometimes it can be very dark. It can be very challenging. And so these pathways are actually just a picture for you of what it would look like for you not to step off the path but instead to say, God, I am going my best as what I can. Maybe I've stepped off the path. Maybe I've fallen off the path to such a place that I'm hurt and I'm injured and it's difficult for me to find my way back up and I feel tempted all the time, but that you would dare to say, wait, what would it look like for me to reach out my hand 
in that place of conviction and say, Jesus, or maybe to say to somebody else within the church, family, could you help me so that I might begin to get back up on the path that God's put in front of us and be able to walk it through? That's the invitation that's really found in the last verse of this passage, which says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This isn't a birth that leads to the, a birth of death. This is a new birth. It's the one that gets to have that crown on the head. And it comes through truth that dispels all of that deception. And though it may be hard to realize, maybe kind of difficult to actually have that light shine on your life, that you, could, that you would recognize that Jesus is willing to choose you to restore your life, to give you a different path, that you don't have to walk in temptation, but that you could actually say, no, I walk in, in victory. I'm not just pursuing a wildflower that will fade and die. I'm actually pursuing that crown that someday will be upon my head that will be a beautiful thing. And what I want you to know, church, is that today we have something to be able to celebrate, something that we're really, really excited about, which is this, that there are two people who uh, are within our part of our church who have just raised their hand and said, hey, you know what, that path that, that Jesus has talked about, that, that king who can give me a crown, I believe he's real. I believe in Jesus, and I want to make it publicly known. I want to step into that new life with God. I want to leave behind the old, and I want to make it publicly known. And so we have Presh, who is a new part of our church just within the last number of months, who is excited about making her faith known. And so, yeah, we're pumped about it, right? And on top of that, uh, we also have Joey, who's uh, a brand new part of our church as well. Joey's part of our our church, and both of these two people, just something that's amazing about them is that they're already figuring out what it looks like to walk with God, right? And Joey has been uh, just a really amazing part of the youth ministry here. He is a servant. He is a person who is figuring out what God's character is going to look like as it continues to unpack in his life. And Presh is somebody who, if you've been here for long, you know that she's welcomed. She's greeted so many different people here already. She is often going after people who are new and saying, Hi, are you new? Hi, good to meet you, right? And that's what we love about Presh uh, on top of so many other things. We are so grateful that God is drawing people in. And so today we get to do a baptism. We get to put both of them into the water. And just for everyone to understand, baptism is a sign. It's not magical. But what it is, it's a sign of us going down into the water in the same way that Jesus went down into the grave and us being raised up alongside of him to new life. And so that's why we celebrate. We clap. In just a minute, when we do the baptism... When they come up out of the water, it's your turn to get loud and rowdy, okay? And a little bit, you can even be a little obnoxious. We don't even mind, right? But if you cheer for your football team or for your basketball team when they score, right? This is a time for you to celebrate the win that God is uh, bringing about in people's lives. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to be tempted. It doesn't mean that they're not going to, you know, mess up down the road. What it means is that they've found the place where they can be washed clean, and that is in Jesus. And they've found a group of people that they want to walk with in life. And so we're excited for Joey. We're excited for Presh. I'm going to invite the worship team to actually come up at this point in time. Um, And I want to say this. If you are a student who is a friend of Joey or a family member of Joey, or if you're a family member or a friend of Presh, uh, we can't have all of you on the stage Um, But we would love it if some of you came up and were up here. We're going to have Joey baptize first. Um, And then for those of you that are family members, if you want to come close, you can either stand right here down in front or you can stand up there. We're just a little informal um, because we're going to do a baptism. So people, you can come forward if you want to, get out your iPhones. um, And we're, right after we baptize them, I want all of you cheer. And then we're going to continue and finish with this song uh, on worship. All right? So, let's do this. 
Joey will have a chance to be baptized first. Joey, you and Holden can head on up. And Holden's going to have a chance to be able to baptize Joey. Joey's put his faith in Jesus. So we're excited. So you can come on up. We warmed the water this week, so it was a little frigid last time, but we, we got a little bit warmer water. <laughs>